started. Uh, thanks uh, so much for uh, joining us uh, today in uh, medical MUHC to Department of Medicine Medical Grand Rounds. And this is our uh, last of the series for the uh, academic year. And uh, I'd like to extend a big uh, thanks to Dr. Gennetti for uh, organizing the series of uh, wonderful talks that we've had uh, over the course of the year and to thank the administrative team for uh, supporting us uh, through uh, another year on Zoom uh, medical grand rounds. And to, to cap off the season, so to speak, we've got uh, a great talk uh, lined up uh, from two very distinguished speakers that. Uh, uh, Dr. Schwartzman will uh, introduce. Uh, before I turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Schwartzman, I'll just remind everybody to please mute uh, and uh, that uh, the discussion uh, uh, question and answer session uh, will be through the chat. So please put your uh, questions or comments in the chat and uh, we'll uh, work through them during the question and answer period. So over to you, Dr. Schwartzman. Thank you, Dr. Roger. So uh, my slightly biased view is that we've saved the best for last uh, for Medical Grand Rounds. Um, it's really a delight and an honor to introduce uh, two friends, colleagues, and mentors, Drs. Uh, Dick Menzies and, and Madhu Pai. Uh, Dick, as many of you know, uh, was the previous director of the respiratory division and uh, is a uh, Canada Research Chair in TB Research and uh, currently the, the head of the McGill International TB Center. And on a personal level was uh, really my, my, my key mentor. And I'll, I'll save you guys the puns about exposing me to, to TB, but uh, that's uh, at least intellectually what, what Dick has done. Um, and uh, Madhu likewise is a, is a key figure in, in the TB world, was previously the, the director of the TB Center as well as a, of global health programs here at McGill and is a Canada Research Chair in Ep Epidemiology and Global Health. Uh, I could go on and on, but I won't because I think the, the topic is, is, is much too important today, but I really wanna thank uh, Dick and Madhu for agreeing to, to give what I know will be a, a compelling talk. So over to you, I guess Dick, I think is, is speaking first if I'm not mistaken. Yes, thank you, Kevin. I'm going to pull up my slides. I hope this works. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Kevin, maybe you can just tell me if you're seeing Canadian tuberculosis standards. Yes, we see well there. And, and it's advancing. Okay, so um, great. So thanks, uh, Dr. Roger. Thanks, Kevin, for the intro and for the chance to present to uh, the uh, Department of Medicine. Um, so uh, I'm going to lead off and Madhu is going to finish off uh, more talking about COVID and TB and the impact of COVID on TB. I'm going to talk about a few highlights from the Canadian TB standards. Um, the Canadian TB standards has been produced uh, by the Canadian Thoracic Society, but by really a lot of people interested in TB across Canada since the 1970s, early 1970s. And this year on World TB Day, we, we um, published the eighth edition, and these are the authors. It's obviously a fairly long list, um, <clears throat> many, many people, quite a few obviously from uh, here at McGill, but indeed it's a very pan-Canadian kind of project. So uh, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the epidemiology of TB in Canada. There's a few messages from here that uh, are interesting and perhaps also a couple that relate to uh, what Madhu will be talking about later. So, you know, the good news is that TB in Canada is a pretty rare disease. Um, both uh, incidence and mortality have really dropped um, uh, dramatically from, you know, back pre-World War II with the introduction of antibiotic effective treatment, et cetera. You see rates have really fallen although there is this rather long tail, it doesn't seem to be completely disappearing. And in more detail over the last 20 years, again, a kind of busy slide, but really this looks pretty flat. And indeed the number of cases in the last, uh, setting aside 2020, um, so in 2019 or 2017 to 2019, those three year average, the number of cases were actually higher in Canada than a decade or two decades ago. So the, so the incidence is really not disappearing in Canada. It's 
it's low but persisting. Um, one of the reasons it's persisting, of course, is the extraordinary epidemic that's going on among the Inuit, uh, both in northern Quebec and Nunavut, paralleled, interestingly, by the similar phenomenon in Greenland, um, where rates of TB have been, and I'm not sure you can see this, I'm going to try to minimize this completely, um, where rates had been you know, 150 to 200 per 100,000, which is similar to rates really of high burden countries in Africa and Asia. Um, interestingly, they fell dramatically in 2020. Uh, I think Madhu may have some insights into why they fell. Is that a real decline uh, or is that simply missed diagnosis uh, due to COVID restrictions? Um, the other interesting point is the case fatality rate uh, still remains quite high. Uh, so TB is a very treatable disease. It's also a preventable disease. You see that in um, uh, somehow the third line is not, um, the symbol is not there, but in, in Canadian born uh, non-Indigenous, the case fatality rate is 9%. It dips down to 6%. It was as high as 16 or 17%. So it's quite high. This is because most of TB in Canadian born non-Indigenous is among the elderly. But if you take only the elderly, you look at a case fatality rate of at least 10%. Um, in the Indigenous populations, it's not zero. And given the high rates, it's, it's important mortality. And the foreign born, which is the uh, orange, also low. But just to emphasize that despite being totally treatable, there still are deaths due to TB in Canada. And drug-resistant TB, as a final epidemiologic point, is quite stable. It's not really increasing, as opposed to many other parts of the world. Um, the main, most common form is INH-resistant TB, which is relatively easy to treat. Multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant, which are really a plague, if you, if you will, in many countries. Again, it's a relatively rare problem in Canada. Difficult to manage when it occurs, but still very small numbers as you see. Okay, I'm gonna jump forward to TB infection, otherwise known as latent TB uh, and the treatment of it. Again, because I think um, in the broader, you know, beyond infectious disease and RESP, I think that where people deal with TB a lot in day-to-day -day practices in TB infection, thinking about prevention uh, or treatment of TB infection. So very briefly, first of all, why test? Why do we do any testing for TB infection? So this is a review uh, done by uh, Jonathan Campbell and others, published just recently. And we looked, uh, he looked at the relative risk of disease in people with a positive test compared to people with a negative test. So some people may think, well, you know, if someone's at high risk, why bother testing? But even in contacts, in children, in people living with HIV, uh, particularly the risk of disease if you're test positive compared to test negative, and these are all untreated people, is very high. And just emphasizing that the tuberculin test or an IGRA, and I'll come back to that, are very helpful to identify really the highest risk groups. So we know contacts are a high-risk group, people living with HIV, obviously. But beyond that, if you do the test and they're negative, then I think there's much more uncertainty about the value of treatment. Whereas if they're test positive, and really, as you see, regardless of which test, very high relative risks. Patients on dialysis, a bit lower relative risk, and solid organ transplant, again, a bit more variable, but still an increased risk. So who to test? So again, who are the highest risk people? So I showed you the relative risks, but now what are some of the absolute risks? So again, it's as a clinician, it can be hard to take a relative risk and translate that into meaningful English or French to a person in front of you, uh, to a patient and explain. But there have been a number of studies that you can estimate the actual risk, so annual risk. So in children, for example, from, uh, again, Jonathan's systematic review, the annual risk after, after finding a positive test 
varies from three, about 3% 3 to almost 15% each year. Again, other uh, reviews, the risks vary, of course, as always, due to different populations and different methods. Um, and in adults too, the risk is high. Per year, a little around 1% to 3.5%, as much as 5% 5, 5 over five years, um, and so on. So you see, again, different estimates, but very high risk. Compare that to the general population. So this is kind of your, maybe your healthcare worker, not after working, but as a student entering work. So up till then, no real exposure. So these general population estimates are more relevant. And here you see much, much lower risk. This is why we kind of try to discourage testing, at least testing for no reason in, gen in low risk populations. And again, a summary of relative and absolute risks in all these other conditions, so beyond the contacts in general. So you see that, again, HIV infection, renal failure, solid organ transplant, and the, the, the variation from study to study is quite a bit, but you see consistently, these are high-risk groups, groups to think about uh, testing. And again, I'd strongly suggest not simply treating without testing, but testing. Okay. <clears throat> And then finally, which test, TST or IGRA? So this is a bit of a debate. Still at the MUHC, we do a lot of tuberculin skin testing, in part, I would say, because we have access to it and you can get a result relatively quickly. Here's the quantifuron very schematically. I think most people are familiar with the quantifuron. It's been available through the MUHC now for years. Uh, quantifuron plus, it has replaced the quantifuron gold intube, which is what the diagram actually shows. Uh, the quantifuron plus has four tubes instead of three, but in fact, the performance, the accuracy is basically the same. The time to result is the same. It's essentially an overnight test. Now, to be honest, at the MUHC, it's a two week to four week wait to get the test done, but that's another matter. It can be as quick as next day results. The TST, I think everybody's familiar with. I don't need to belabor the points. Here's my summary. Uh, maybe uh, my view is a bit biased. The TST, the good points, it's relatively cheap. It can be done anywhere. So it's easy to you know, carry a vial in a cooler, to a home, to a clinic, et cetera. It's relatively simple to learn. It's definitely reproducible with in good hands. And it does predict both risk of disease and benefit of treatment. The IGRAs, the main advantage of IGRAs is that they have excellent specificity. There are, of course, no adverse effects. There's no local reaction. Uh, and it's lab-based, so it should be objective. There's no, oh, please, I really don't need a positive test. Can you make it nine instead of 10 kind of thing going on. Um, the bad points with TST, the specificity is definitely suboptimal, particularly in BCG vaccinated populations, which are, which are most foreign born, but particularly those vaccinated after infancy, which is most foreign born coming from Europe, including Eastern Europe and former Soviet republics. Um, the sensitivity is suboptimal. Um, it's affected by immune deficiency or HIV or people, let's say, with rheumatologic disease who are already on steroids and other uh, meds. Uh, the results are delayed by, you get a result only in two to three days, and it does require two visits. Someone has to come back for a reading. And while it is simple to learn and reproducible, still the technique has to be correct. Like any test, you got to have some reasonable quality assurance. The IGRA bad points, the sensitivity is the same as TST, no difference there. It's also affected by immune deficiency. The accessibility is reduced. Again, it's not a problem at the MUHC, but you need a lab that does ELISA-based testing. Uh, the results are 24 hours. As I said, MUHC can be longer. It's definitely more expensive. And there are some problems with serial testing, so we don't recommend it for healthcare workers who are getting annual testing. So one solution are the so-called next generation tuberculins. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but there are three tuberculins that are now uh, 
approved by WHO. Uh, none of them, sadly, are licensed for use in Canada. Uh, the one that's had the most study is the one now made in India, but was initially made in, uh, in, uh, and developed in Copenhagen, Denmark. So I've done quite a lot of studies. They've shown it has good safety, good accuracy, and very good specificity. So these are basically tuberculins that use exactly the same material as are found in IGRAS, which are therefore specific to M tuberculosis and a few non-tuberculous non mycobacteria. So again, just very briefly, some results of the new tuberculin versus QFT, very similar results, very good agreement, um, and very good specificity in BCG vaccinated compared to regular uh, tuberculin skin testing. So um, I think of the potential, if we can get our hands on the new tuberculins and the IGRAs being a kind of a one-two punch, the IGRA will always be preferred in some settings and some patient populations. And tuberculin skin testing is a good option if we can get our the new tuberculins in others. So stay tuned as to whether we can get our hands on the new tuberculins. Okay, so moving on to treatment. So again, treatment is something where there has been quite substantial changes since the last standards. We, um, uh, the last standards was basically nine months INH was the standard for Canada, and that was in 2013. So the major change is INH is kind of down, downgraded to second line or alternative, and the first line regimens are either once weekly rifampentine INH through HP, or daily RIF for four months, 4R, which is of course an, an in-house favorite. And when they're not tolerated, then nine months INH is the preferred alternative. We don't recommend three months daily INH RIF because it has the combination of toxicity of INH and the drug interactions of RIF. So sort of why trade one bad adverse event for another when you can have both is my view of 3HR. And there is, there has been one study done on one HP, one month daily INH rifapentine. This was only done in um, HIV infected individuals and trials are ongoing to see if it works and is safe and well tolerated in non HIV infected populations. So again, three HP. So this is 12 doses. So once a week, seems like a great regimen. Has should be directly observed. Um, and low rates of liver toxicity, very low rates, although there are, are other adverse events um, which range, but overall the completion rate, sorry, the, I would say the non-completion rate due to adverse events with 3HP is similar to 99H. So safety-wise, maybe a little issue, although the liver toxicity is much less, and that's been the one that has really been a major problem with INH. Uh, 4R, uh, again, uh, several trials, although admittedly all from us, um, excellent efficacy and completion, fully self-administered, tested in kind of all settings across the world, very low rates of liver toxicity. So rifampin is definitely the least patotoxic of the first-line drugs. There's definitely a risk of allergy. There are some hematologic problems occasionally. But uh, drug interactions really are the greatest limitation, particularly sort of in practice as you start to expand use. There are uh, interactions with many HIV meds, but efavirenz based regimens or dolutegravir, though the dose needs to be doubled for that, those regimens are uh, safe and effective. Um, and, but there are many other meds. So transplant and uh, direct oral anticoagulants those have important interactions that are hard to predict and very hard to measure. So we don't recommend rifampin for patients on those drugs. Diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroid, lots of other drug interactions, but those, if you follow closely, are manageable. And I emphasize closely, you need to see people after a week as drug interactions kick in early. And overall, 4R is the only regimen so far with drug discontinuation for adverse events less significantly less than 99H. So it appears to be the safest regimen 
of those that are currently recommended. So again, I think of 3HP and 4R as a bit of a one-two punch. 3HP is ideal for populations with historically low completion rates of uh, TB preventive therapy. Every dose directly observed, but it's only 12 doses, so that's quite feasible for many programs. So again, certain populations uh, in the urban setting, homeless, prisons, those kinds of things may be ideal. And there are also remote communities where DOT is already the standard of care, and this can be implemented at the same time. It's quite easy and often acceptable, again, for the populations there. On the other hand, 4R is ideal for many other populations. It's safe, so there's really a bit less need for careful in-person follow-up. It's not clear you even need to do routine blood monitoring once you're on treatment, especially if there's no other risk factors. It's well tolerated, adherence and completion are generally good, and it's convenient because it's self-administered. So again, as I said, drug-drug interactions are an issue, but if people not on other meds, then I think it's a great one. One note I would also mention, rifampin does interact with any hormonal contraception. So that's again, an important consideration in uh, women of childbearing age. Contacts of a drug resistant case. Um, so if uh, the index TB patient is INH resistance, that's quite easy, it's rifampin. Uh, but if they're MDR, there is a large trial that has almost finished. They finished enrollment and follow-up phase. So they're in analysis now. A testing Levo for six months against placebo. So we'll know soon whether it works. And frankly, we'll know whether Levo works in general for uh, contacts. And we may be able to base recommendations for people in whom INH and rifampin may be contraindicated. I'm thinking of people with advanced liver disease uh, where now we often use Levo, but without much evidence. So this may also provide evidence in support of that group as well. So there are a few trials going on. Uh, there's four weeks daily INH RIF for non-HIV population. So that's one HP. There's six weeks daily with Pentine. Uh, that's a CDC TB trials consortium trial that's ongoing. And eight weeks high dose RIF for two months to R squared. That's a trial that we're leading and is ongoing now. Happy for referrals from anybody in my group. So the last topic I wanted to cover, uh, this is something again that, you know, at least in internal medicine and certainly RESP, we deal with this problem all the time. And it's a particularly um, troublesome uh, topic because there is so little clear evidence. So the current standards is basically someone's got smear positive TB, they're, they're in isolation for at least two weeks and until three consecutive sputum smears are negative. And that can take a long time. So sputum smear conversion took a median of 27 days with a mean of 37 days. There's this long tail. And again, in Alberta, you see very long time to conversion median 42 days in Alberta. So it, this condemns people to isolation for a very long time. Um, so what exactly is this based on? And in truth, I had some hand in crafting the earlier recommendations and in reviewing the evidence in the past. So this review is not done by me. This was done by someone, um, Ryan Cooper from Edmonton. So I'm just uh, stealing his. So the first question is, sputum smear the right endpoint? So again, um, as we said, there it takes a long time uh, to, con to see uh, smear conversion. And there are several lines of evidence that perhaps people with pulmonary TB are non-infectious soon after initiation of therapy. So maybe sputum smear just isn't the right marker. So first let's look at animal studies. So transmission, from humans to guinea pigs, humans with TB to guinea pigs stops, nearly stops within a day or two of initiation. What they did is they put patients treated for TB, they waited one or two days after start of treatment, and then they put them in these rooms where the exhaust air floated up and, and uh, basically the guinea pigs were living in cages, sort of in the ventilation shafts, if you will. So they were exposed for weeks and very few were infected as long as people had been on effective treatment. 
So they could have MDR as long as they were on effective MDR treatment or drug sensitive as long as they were on standard treatment. So a few, very few were infected. They didn't actually quite define though when that transmission occurred. So you know, it was 2% small enough. So then there's biomarkers. So cough aerosol sampling, very specialized devices to measure how many viable bacilli are produced. And it does predict infectiousness better than conventional smear. And two studies showed that production declined rapidly within days. But anyway, they're not quite, it's not quite there yet. We don't quite have the exact amount of time till more than 95 or 98% of people are negative. So this is still sort of an early biomarker stage of study. Okay, so clinical studies. So this issue was first considered in 1957, which is arguably before most of the audience was born. People were thinking about whether to isolate. So it's kind of a shame that here we are, however many years later, um, still thinking about it, still talking about it, and still with rather poor evidence. So this one trial was done in 1957. They randomized people to stay in hospital and get treated, a sanatorium really, or go home immediately and start treatment from home. And there was no difference in TB incidence. There was no difference in TST conversion, TST positivity, and so on. But there were some limitations because, you know, 80% of the household contacts were already TSTF positive. They already had very high rates of TB anyway in both groups. And of course, the contact, household contacts visited they, their, their, you know, they had to go into the hospital to give them food or whatever, take care of them. So there was still a lot of contact, even though they were in the sanitary. So not a perfect study, but still at least a randomized trial. Observational studies, there have been a couple. Bottom line, no, uh, <clears throat> people were de-isolated after about four weeks, no difference in infection rates. They were early de-isolated at four weeks or not. And two non-comparative, again, very small studies, 27 people with TB, 21 people, no evidence of transmission after treatment was started. So fairly, for, for the amount of time and resources that go into hospitalizing or isolating people, and the consequences, remarkably little evidence. So what about case reports? So case reports, you know, I, I teach a little bit about research methods and I always talk about case reports as kind of the lowest level of evidence, the starting point in research. Um, so uh, after reviewing this literature, I, I begin to think I've denigrated case reports a bit too much. So there is exactly one case report of transmission occurring after the start of anti-TB treatment. One patient got one dose of TB therapy, arrested within 24 hours, less than 24 hours, had such extensive disease, prolonged resuscitation, you can imagine that. Um, and there was clear evidence of transmission from that person to personnel, to healthcare personnel. But interestingly, there has been no other reports, no case series, no other case reports of confirmed TB transmission occurring after a person with pulmonary TB started treatment, one week or more, whatever. And yet I know personally, having reviewed the literature a few times, there are maybe hundreds of case reports of transmission from untreated persons, usually undiagnosed. So the summary is animal studies, no transmission from treated persons or less than 2%. CAS studies, no cont contagiousness rapidly falls. RCT, no transmission. Three observational, no transmission. But all of them have substantial limitations. So in fact, the best evidence is the complete absence of evidence that hundreds of case reports identify TB transmission and describe it in all kinds of settings and unusual uh, situations, submarines to autopsies to funeral homes to, you know, um, con rock star concerts. Anyway, it's quite a literature. Uh, all of them before treatment, before diagnosis and treatment. Only one case report, and that's only one dose. And we don't even know how long after the dose was given, the patient arrested. So, in fact, that's actually our best evidence. We don't have 
any case report, nothing of documented transmission more than 24 hours after treatment started. Um, and yeah, so I would encourage people to think about not just for this, but maybe for other areas that case reports sometimes really are helpful. In this case, the absence of case reports, despite you know, obviously generations of people trying to find case reports to write up and publish, um, we haven't found them. So what are some potential harms? Hospitalized patients receive less nursing attention. There's, this is for other diseases. So they receive less nursing attention and let's face it, medical attention. Who goes into the room when there's all these signs on the door? They experience events and patients not in isolation. So this is documented. Isolation is associated with significant anxiety, fear, and mood dysfunction. They have less visitors, of course. Uh, qualitative studies indicate a pre strong preference for early de, de isolation, of course, over prolonged hospitalization. Uh, and this we've definitely seen. Providers may want to intensify therapy, give more drugs to get people to have smear conversion faster. So this does not, in fact, work, or at least there's no evidence. But it does, of course, tend to increase adverse events. Health system costs obviously are huge with prolonged hospitalization. Again, people on D8 will be nodding on this one. Um, and even just documenting conversion. So we do sputum induction all the time, many, just to try to document conversion. And if patients are hospitalized or at home, but on isolation, they can't work or go to school sometimes for months. So patient costs are huge. This can be catastrophic uh, for the person who is the major uh, income uh, for the household. So the new TB standards, we tried to balance the well-documented potential harms of prolonged isolation versus the unknown and undocumented risk of TB transmission. Um, <clears throat> so we still, to be honest, we had a long debate with the infection control kind of community who were very involved Involved in, in this, this is what came out. Uh, but at least I can say that the infection control community, such as it is in Canada, was uh, solidly in agreement with these recommendations. So this particular one hasn't changed. What changed is that basically four weeks is the max for people with smear positive but susceptible pulmonary TB. It's not a very big change. You may think that I've spent a long time talking to you about it, what seems like a modest gain. But I think for some patients, at least, uh, this will be important. And perhaps it's a step in the right direction and will prompt further research into the area to get better evidence. Okay, Madhu, over to you. Thank you, Dick. Thanks, everyone. Dick, can you uh, change, change to the next slide? Um, so what has the... COVID pandemic done to TB care and the trajectory of the TB epidemic. So we published a couple of analysis and I've put a link um, to, in the, to both the papers in the chat box. I've also put a link to the Canadian TB standards. You're welcome to download and, and look at it. Next slide, Dick. So the big picture is as follows. In 2020, and we don't have 2021 uh, global data yet, um, compared to the previous years, we've had about 10 million people who fell sick with active TB, but the big problem is only 5.8 million of them were either diagnosed or reported to have access to TB care, which is a steep decline from what it was in 2019. So we earlier had a gap of 3 million people who were undiagnosed or not reported. That gap has now become 4.1 million. So we missed a lot of people during year one of the pandemic. Next slide. And the biggest uh, case notification drops, which is about 20% globally, um, has happened in some of the highest TB burden countries. India is right at the top. Indonesia has had seen a big drop in case notification. Philippines, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. Um, while I don't, well, the WHO report doesn't get into it, we know a similar problem has happened in the Inuit indigenous communities in Canada as well. The healthcare disruptions were so severe that a lot of people who should have been tested for TB simply did not get 
are tested or notified with TB. Um, there's also a massive data gap in Canada. As uh, Dick mentioned, we still don't have accurate real-time data coming in the way we've had for COVID. So we'll have to wait literally a year before we get to know what has gone on uh, with TB, which is a huge disappointment given how much we have dashboards for COVID, but we don't have equivalent real-time reporting for TB yet. Next slide. And to illustrate what this drop in case notification means and the devastating impact of this, I wanna use India because India is the world's highest TB burden country, the country where I do all my TB work. If you look at the epidemic curve for COVID in India, India has had three massive waves. The first wave was associated with one of the most brutal lockdowns anywhere in the world. The second uh, wave was last summer, around this time, um, catastrophic uh, Delta variant that slammed the country, which was mostly unvaccinated at that time. And then we, the country just had a, an Omicron wave. And if you, when the dust settles, WHO estimates that India may have had 4.7 million excess deaths, which is almost tenfold higher than the official reported stats. The economist model puts it closer to 5 million excess deaths. Next slide. All of this resulted in a devastating impact on TB. If you can look at these, uh, the every single wave led to a very steep drop in the number of TB patients um, diagnosed and notified, and then slowly it limps back towards baseline after many, many months, and then another wave comes. And then again, there's a big dip, and then again, it limps back to normal. The cumulative effect of this is that so many people in India who have TB have simply not received diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. All of this on a global scale uh, led to WHO concluding that we've had about roughly 1.5 million TB deaths worldwide, which means it's the first increase in TB deaths since 2005. So we attribute this increase in TB mortality to uh, inadequate treatment uh, to people with uh, tuberculosis. Next slide. So what does this mean for the big picture goal of ending the TB pandemic by 2030, which is a sustainable development goal? So even without COVID-19, honestly, we were not on track to achieving the SDG goals for 2030. But with COVID-19, and you can see the, um, the second graph, the mathematical model suggests that we're going to see a much worsening of the TB uh, epidemic before it starts getting better. And unless there's a dramatic miracle, literally, in terms of a new vaccine, a mass vaccination, or a, a spectacular uh, penetration of active case finding and preventive therapy for latent TB, we're not going to be able to bend the curve. So um, I, for one, have no hopes that we will reach the 2030 uh, SDG goals for TB, not at the rate uh, the pandemic has destabilized TB care. Stop TB partnership um, estimates that we've lost a decade of progress in TB uh, in, in the last two years. Next slide. So um, our New England Journal paper um, lists a bunch of things that need to happen if there's any hope for recovering TB. And right on top is our recommendation that we have to vaccinate the world for COVID because if there are new variants that are going to emerge in mostly unvaccinated parts of the world or under-vaccinated parts of the world, which is primarily low and middle-income countries, TB will be again hit very hard. And every wave we've seen uh, devastates uh, already weak health systems and TB programs. And so at a minimum, we've got to push hard to vaccinate 70% of each country's population, which is what WHO um, recommends. Next slide. So we have other several immediate term, short term and long term uh, suggestions in our paper. But I think there are there's one thing that we can do right away that is trying to bring back case notifications that we've lost. We have to find people who we've missed during the last two years of the pandemic. Um, next slide. And here, I think we have so much that we need to understand uh, and learn from COVID-19. I think one of the most stunning things that we've learned uh, during this pandemic is that if you want to, we can truly take diagnosis very close to people's homes, very close to people's schools, very close to people's workplaces, and make it as easy as possible for them to get tested if they wanted to. 
I mean, this level of innovation is unheard of uh, for TB. And TB is still a disease for which we are using microscopy, uh, 100-year-old technology in most parts of the world. We still, uh, microscopy is not available in many primary care settings. We do not have a point of care test for TB, and we've certainly not innovated around simple sample collection methods like oral swabs or tongue swabs to make TB testing less reliant on sputum or sputum microscopy for that matter. So taking diagnosis close to home is a big, big lesson that I think we need to learn from uh, COVID and apply to TB. Next slide. And this certainly applies to the indigenous settings where if we can take rapid molecular testing close to, to the indigenous communities, um, there's great potential to improve case detection. The other thing that uh, the TB community is pushing hard is integrated testing for COVID and TB. Given that molecular tests work beautifully for both infections, given that there are um, you know, cartridge-based automated uh, PCR solutions that can do both. Um, so we have a big CIHR funded study in Peru right now where we've successfully shown that you can integrate TB and COVID testing on the same person in, with the same sample, with the same device. But we are also wondering at what point in the epidemic does this integrated testing make any sense? For example, if the COVID numbers are low, why would one waste time looking for COVID um, in a country? And, and the profile of uh, Omicron now, uh, mostly as an upper respiratory scratchy throat, not as a chronic cough, probably makes these two syndromes fairly separated. So there's probably no need to invest in, in both testing for the same person. So it depends on the epidemiology and depends on the context is what we are trying to um, say in our uh, project. Next slide. The other thing we've again done with COVID-19 is take treatment as close to people's homes as possible. Even here in uh, Canada, we've used tele telemedicine and telehealth. There are now digital adherence technologies that allow us to remotely support people uh, with TB so that they don't have to come to the clinic to do DOT. It's a, it's a remarkable progress we made since the DOT for everybody, hardcore military style approach that we had about 20 years ago to more of a menu driven approach where we have, we can send text messages to people to remind them, we can have call centers, we can have smart pill boxes, we can do a whole bunch of things. We can even send people medicines home through digital pharmacies or e-pharmacies or telemedicine services. So again, taking diagnosis close to homes, taking TB treatment close to home, I think both these have extraordinary relevance to the indigenous communities that are very scattered and not easy to, to, uh, for them to access care and centralized services. I think this is a, a really important lesson from COVID-19. Next slide. And as Dick mentioned, we have now several shorter regimens this is one of the biggest advances in TB in the last decade. Um, um, Dick and others have shown that it's definitely possible to reduce latent TB duration to three to four months. Drug sensitive TB, WHO just endorsed a four month uh, regimen. Um, it's based on rifampentin and moxie and drug resistant TB. Wow, from a toxic 24 month uh, regimen with full of uh, painful injections, the WHO now has endorsed two six-month all oral uh, regimens, which dramatically reduce the pill burden. And childhood TB treatment can now be reduced to four months in children with non-severe TB. So three to four to six months is where we are landing in all forms of TB, which is phenomenally exciting. And I can't see why these sorts of regimens that are oral, no injectables, cannot be done remotely and better supported um, uh, to, to decentralize it to where people live and work. Next slide. Um, there is one thing I, I'm hoping personally that we can take from COVID-19 is just as the mRNA platform is now being repurposed for malaria, HIV, and other infectious diseases, um, we would love to see a better vaccine for TB. Unfortunately, the investments in COVID vaccines is a thousandfold higher than it TB has ever received in the history of TB. We're still using the 100-year-old BCG vaccine. So if we can take one silver lining out of this pandemic, repurpose this mRNA platform to identify a better vaccine for TB, and people like Maz Divangahi uh, and others in our TB center are working on it, it will be a huge advance because without a better vaccine, um, there is simply no way to bend the curve on TB, and that's an important lesson from uh, COVID as well. I think that's my last slide, Dick. You can uh, close the 
slides. Thank you. Dr. Menzies, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think I did. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Madhu and Dick, uh, for that uh, uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, overview of uh, uh, TB update and 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 uh, and the impact of COVID uh, on TB and for that thought provoking call to action. Um, so we've got uh, we've got some comments and questions uh, in the chat. Uh, one comment uh, seems to suggest that the uh, TB quantitative at MUHC is actually closer to five or six weeks turnaround time. Dick, any comments about what we can do to get that back to reasonable? Um, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the problem is at the lab. You know, the test itself, it's an overnight incubation, and then it's just a question of how long it takes to run the ELISAs. I mean, the, the, um, it's cheaper if you batch. But <clears throat> I assume since it's now five or six weeks, there must be quite a lot that are ready to, to go as a batch. So it presumably it's just a question of running more batches to get the time down to something a bit more reasonable. Okay. Then Dr. Merritt uh, asks with non-INH uh, regimens being recommended for latent TB, how, how does this change with age as a factor when deciding on treatment? Yeah, so um, so it's interesting. We um, we know that really the the risk of toxicity, of course, was not just age over thirty five. Was that was kind of one post hoc analysis, but it was a fairly continuous increase of risk, uh, with particularly high risk in the uh, in the elderly, sixty five and over, at a two percent hospitalization rate for uh, hepatitis alone. Um, RIF doesn't seem to be quite as age dependent in terms of the toxicity. But again, we don't have these large populations yet. It's kind of like you need, you need bigger cohorts to really understand the uh, um, sort of post phase three RCT data to really understand the risks in older populations because you know, our RCT was a relatively small number of people in that age range. But uh, at least up to 65, there wasn't like a clear age gradient for risk. Okay, great. Uh, and Dr. Gilfix asks about uh, whether you can amplify on what you meant by variability of results on serial, I guess, quantitative testing. Sure. Well, Madhu can also comment on this because he wrote a few papers on it. I don't know if you want to comment, Madhu. Yeah, so um, just like the tuberculin, which is uh, has inter-reader variability in how you administer it and how you read it, the induration, we've learned over the years, and there's a lot of literature on it, that quantiferon has a lot of pre-analytical steps. So when you draw blood into the tubes, you have to shake it in a certain way, then you have to incubate it. So all of that results in variability. And then of course, two ELISAs on the same sample will have variability. So when you accumulate all of this, we find that you, you will see a wobble around the cutoff. So the cu cutoff is 0.35 international units per mil. There will be repeat. So this, if I tested Dick now with quantiferon and I tested Dick tomorrow, he might flip from negative to positive if he's around the threshold. So that's why if you do serial testing, a slight wobble over the cutoff could be misinterpreted as a conversion when for tuberculin, we expect the induration to increase quite a bit, right? So DIC six, six millimeter increase or 10 millimeter increase is the TSD cutoff in the TB standards now. Conversion, so, TSD conversion. Sure, millimeter. so if you repeat tuberculin testing, we expect variability Two standard deviations is five millimeters. So that's why we recommend six millimeters as a real increase. And so it's the same with quantiferon, as you said. So from just above the threshold to about three times the threshold is considered, mm, be careful in interpreting it. It might revert back to negative and when you repeat it often does. Whereas strong positive, much more likely a real, a real signal there. Great. And, and Dick, you seem to be uh, making good case for uh, a, a more definitive study on uh, de-isolation. Uh, would would uh, what 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 would the design of that study be? Is 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 an interventional cohort study adequate? To, what what threshold would you would you use uh, 
uh, to sort of define success if, uh, if it were a cohort study, or do you think we have to do an RCT? So, I mean, one thing that's possible are these large uh, population-based studies where, so for example, um, you know, there are places where de-isolation occurs early and with whole genome sequencing now, you can much better define when transmissions occurred from one person to another. And you have to combine that, of course, with old fashioned shoe leather epidemiology to see when they had contact, et cetera. But I think those are the kind of studies that could be done that would at least give you some evidence that there had been or there is no evidence of transmission after treatment started. Again, they're not easy to do, but I think it's, I think it's plausible. I think a randomized trial is, would be very difficult. I think the other thing are these biomarkers. There are, uh, beyond the cast, there are other biomarkers of measures of aerosol production. And uh, it's still a work in progress, but they're trying to correlate that with other measures of infectiousness and seeing the effect of therapy. So those are the other kind of studies. Okay. And Dr. Frenette's uh, got a question about uh, with the shorter course uh, prophylaxis, any ideas for massive population treatment in those communities who've had major outbreaks up north? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting thought. I mean, of course, one of the problems of these communities is that we have seen reinfection and disease after you know, one round of treatment. Uh, the, the population seems particularly uh, susceptible. Um, but certainly the, this mass screening has been done in a couple of the highest risk communities where they screen everybody and they treat with 4R uh, all those who uh, are found to be test positive and have not been treated before or in some cases have been treated but remotely and obviously who agree. So it is being done in, a, in some communities in uh, Nunavik. Okay. And Dr. Frenette also asks if there's a role for annual testing of healthcare workers in high risk areas, example, mm. the chest. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's two advantages for annual testing. Uh, the first and most obvious is protection of the worker. They have in inadvertent exposure, uh, unrecognized from a usually undiagnosed patient who comes sort of through and disappears again. Um, and so you find they've converted from one year to the next or six months later, and you can offer them uh, treatment immediately before they develop disease. And the other is a bit, you know, it's a bit of a marker. If you're doing this in your, in a group of workers regularly, and suddenly there's several who convert, you know, you know, something went wrong, and then you can perhaps look into it. That would be more of a secondary gain, but I consider it still a, a second, a, an important bit of information. Uh, Dick, uh, just a, a question for you. Given that the uh, incidence of um, TB in healthcare workers is very low in Canada, not in the Inuit uh, areas, obviously, did the TB standards make any uh, change in terms of maybe not demanding an annual testing with such oh, a thank, low? Thank you, Madhu. A very good point. Yes, very good. So yes, um, the TB standards recommended against annual testing of healthcare workers other than those considered at very high risk. So resp tax, again, uh, what Charles is referring to would remain a, a group potentially at risk. Uh, and the risk assessment is very much a kind of local phenomenon where you, you say, okay, we've got TB patients coming in and this group is likely, you know, ex potentially exposed to undiagnosed patients. So this is a group to test. But otherwise, just testing all healthcare workers at the MUHC or all clinical healthcare workers, no, that is no longer recommended. This is quite important, Dick. So have we communicated this to the occupational health uh, folks so that they can make the change if they're wasting all their energies on low-risk people right now? It's, that seems like a hugely important cost-saving and important thing to do. Um, you're right, Madhu. I have not personally reached out um, but I see Charles is there, yeah, shaking Charles. his head, let's, taking uh, notes. Let's put him so on I'd the spot. Happy to follow up with Charles. Sorry, what was the question? Pardon me. Did you ask a question? So it was just that Madhu's comment was, 
um, on, about routine testing of healthcare workers. And I was saying that the Canadian TB standards, again, the infection control group particularly led this one. They recommended against routine testing of all healthcare workers or all clinical healthcare workers. And they recommend continuing only for those judged at, at significantly higher risk. So rest packs or people with- Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with you. You know, the matter, the fact of the matter is, is we've had very, very few TP in healthcare workers, certainly at the MUHC. Uh, we've had a lot of, you know, exposures. Every year we have two or three significant exposures. You know, the classical case is the lung cancer operated and it turns out to be a TB in the lung. And yet we have, we've had very few conversion. Unfortunately, from an OH point of view, you know, I, I don't think we've been up to par to do the annual uh, testing, you know, of TB lab workers, of people with the chest. Um, and, and even uh, in our list, we have emergency uh, healthcare workers. Um, but, but, you know, that's why I was asking the question of whether it's really worth still doing or not, um, given the very, very, you know, low incidence that we are observing in, in healthcare workers. Well, one of the things that has changed quite a bit is the routine uh, pre-employment testing for PPD. So I just want to remind people that if you're born in Canada and you haven't lived, you know, abroad, a uh, significant amount of time. We don't recommend routine PPD testing at employment. Uh, we recommend it now only for people uh, who have had significant exposure, you know, either in their family or, or abroad. So that's been a major change as well. And, and basically we consider people, you know, negative to start with uh, if, if they're born here. So that, that's like you say, Matt, let's put, you know, we're trying to decrease the burden on, on occupational health, which has had quite a bit to do uh, with other things lately. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I think the, the move to de-emphasize regular periodic testing in healthcare workers is also in the US, they've done the same. So, uh, so you can focus for sure on higher risk groups, okay. Great. Uh, so we're, we're down to sort of our final minutes. Um, uh, perhaps, Madhu, I'll, I'll ask you uh, a, a thought experiment. If, if we had uh, uh, deployed all the resources that we've deployed for COVID over the course of the last two and a half years uh, to TB, do you think we would have made a major dent or cured TB? I mean, uh, with TB, um, we we do have a lot of the tools that we need today. It's just that the the access remains a massive problem. Like I said, millions of people are still getting diagnosed with smears, uh, even in 2022, while the world has done billions of COVID PCRs, right? Which just tells you that if we wanted to make molecular testing the baseline standard standard for everyone with suspected TB, we could do it. The technology exists and people and labs exist. We just never thought it was important enough to do. So for me, one lesson from COVID is money and resources really are not the rate limiting step. It's just that we choose to neglect some diseases uh, and TB is one such disease. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for, uh, again, a, a fantastic uh, end to the uh, Medical Grand Rounds season for this academic year. Uh, great talk, great discussion. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right. Thank you.